So um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and um, firstly, um, I'd like to uh, um, have all of us uh, um, welcome uh, Tom to, uh, to Berkeley. I'm happy you were, <laughs> you were able to join us. And also really happy you, um, you were willing to, to give us the set of lectures uh, um, about, um, about uh, the weak gravity conjecture and the swamp plate of string theory, a subject on which um, you're one of the world's expert on. So um, welcome, Tom, and, um, and, and thank you. Uh, I think uh, the, the lectern, <laughs> so to say, is yours. <laughs> great, thanks. Yeah, th thanks, Mina, and, and thank you all for uh, coming to hear a little bit about the weak gravity conjecture and the swampland. So uh, I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen now. And uh, great, looks good. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so, uh, so indeed, I'm going to be talking in this uh, series about the weak gravity conjecture and the swampland. Uh, and this will be a series of three lectures. So um, in the first one, we're going to be focused uh, primarily just on sort of background and definitions. So this will definitely, unfortunately, be uh, the most boring of the three lectures. So uh, unfortunately, we, you know, we got to get the boring stuff out of the way. But uh, what will actually be kind of exciting is that you'll, you'll see that what the sort of the background and the uh, definitions that we talk about are, seem relatively boring. It seems like things that, that you really couldn't get much physics out of. And that's what's going to be exciting in lectures two and three is we start to look at some of the evidence for the weak gravity conjecture and uh, some of the implications of the weak gravity conjecture and the swampland. Uh, and we're going to see just sort of how, how broad the impact of these very simple statements is on many, many different areas of high energy physics. So uh, let me begin by apologizing for my terrible handwriting. It's always terrible. It's especially bad with this thing. But, uh, just ask questions if you can't read anything. Okay, so uh, with that, let's get going. So, uh, so today we're talking about background and definitions. And we're going to start with uh, the topic of the string landscape and the swampland. So it's pretty well known that string theory is a uh, consistent theory of quantum gravity. And in the ultraviolet, it seems that string theory is actually unique. There are different limits of string theory, uh, which go under names like type 2a and type 2b. But there, although there's, uh, but there seems to be just a unique theory in the ultraviolet. However, if one starts from the ultraviolet and flows down to the infrared, do some renormalization group flow, uh, sorry, let's start a new whiteboard. So one starts from the ultraviolet, starts from the ultraviolet, and flows down to the infrared. There seem to be not just one, but many consistent effective field theories, which are compatible with string theory in the ultraviolet. So one one example would be presumably the standard model is an example of a low energy effective field theory that's consistent with string theory. But there seem to be many, many others. Sometimes the, the code number that you hear for this is something like 10 to the 500 consistent uh, low energy EFTs. But in fact, uh, we, we really don't know how many there are. There seem to be a lot. Now, whether you think this landscape of low energy effective field theories is a good thing or a bad thing, in large part depends on your perspective. But certainly from the pr perspective of testing string theory experimentally, the landscape is a bit of a headache. Simply put, the more uh, possible effective field theories you have, the harder it is to make a prediction. So from this perspective, there actually seems to be some good news, which is that although this string landscape 
all of these effective field theories consistent with string theory seems to be very large, it's likely only a small part of an even larger swampland of, of effective field theories. So the swampland is defined to be the set of low energy effective field theories, which seem consistent to a low energy observer. but which cannot be consistently coupled to gravity and completed in the ultraviolet. Or in other words, they cannot be consistently coupled to quantum gravity. Now there's a sort of a cartoon map of the string landscape and the swampland that I can draw. So here we have all of these different uh, low energy effective field theories that are consistent with string theory. And there's you know, some 10 to the 500 of these guys. There's also some continuous families of them. So maybe some, uh, some regions kind of like this. Nonetheless, so okay, so this is the landscape. Nonetheless, though, this landscape seems to be only a small part of a much larger ocean of swampland. So if this is the, the whole set, it is all just the set of, of seemingly consistent seemingly consistent uh, effective field theories. The landscape is sort of a, a set of islands or a chain of islands inside this uh, larger ocean of swampland, which is the complement of the landscape. So this is sort of the, the picture that you should have in your head of what the landscape in the swampland look like. Now the goal of the whole swampland program, as it's sometimes called, is to delineate the boundary between landscape and swampland. In other words, we want to figure out what are the universal features of theories in this landscape that distinguish them from the theories in the swampland? What, in other words, are the universal features of quantum gravity theories? And just as importantly, how do we put these universal features to the test? How do we derive low energy consequences from these uh, from this distinction of the landscape in the swampland that we can actually go out and measure. And this is really a crucial, a crucial ingredient in the ultimate goal, which is, uh, sorry, how do we test string theory? So we're trying to figure out what, what are things that we can actually test? What are features of string theory that we can put to the test? Now, this all sounds very nice, right? I mean, for, for many, many years, people would have, would have loved nothing more than to develop some sort of experimental consequences of string theory, something that we can go out and test. In practice, this is quite difficult for the simple reason that quantum gravity is actually quite hard. So in practice, the way that this whole Swampland program has taken shape is through a number of different so-called Swampland conjectures. So the way this works is that someone will look at a bunch of examples of effective field theories in the landscape. They'll find features which seem to be true in all of them, and they'll conjecture that these features should in fact be universally true for any consistent theory in the landscape. 
other people will then go out and try to test these conjectures. So in some cases, finding more evidence or more examples in their favor. In some cases, finding more bottom-up type arguments as to why they should be true. In some cases, finding counterexamples to the conjectures. So let me uh, give you just a little list of some swampland conjectures. Many, many of these conjectures have been discussed, but some of the more famous ones are no global symmetries, which is something that we'll talk about momentarily. The weak gravity conjecture, which is again something that we'll be talking about for, for really the next three lectures. There's something called the swampland distance conjecture. Again, a very uh, well studied example. Uh, there's things like the De Sitter conjectures, which are unfortunately sometimes just referred to as the swampland conjecture or the swampland conjectures, especially within the cosmology community. But it's important to note that these are just, ex oh, sorry, just examples of uh, some particular ex uh, swampland conjectures. Tom, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm trying to make the connection with the claim that we're testing string theory. Um, it, it seems to me that both generally the um, the thing that that you're pursuing most generally is is consequences of quantum gravity, right? So these these uh, so some of the things that you're discussing presumably uh, should hold in in any theory that can be completed to a consistent theory of quantum gravity, regardless of whether that theory is string theory or not. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I'm being a little bit fast and loose with the distinction. I mean, some people would argue that there, that there is no distinction, that the only consistent theory of quantum gravity is string theory. I'm not assuming that for these lectures. Uh, so in principle, one could talk about both sort of a string swampland and a, and a more general quantum gravity swampland, which would, I guess, be a subset of that. But for, for our purposes in this talk, I'm not going to be too careful with that. We'll see that there are some arguments for these conjectures which, tend, which seem to be more general, some which assume string theory. Uh, I'm not, going, I'm not going to be too, too dogmatic about the distinction. I think it's really important also giving, given the history of the subject to not make claims that are too strong about testing string theory uh, when maybe what we're doing is exploring consequences of string theory under certain assumptions. And, and in other cases, what we're doing is exploring consequences of uh, you know, requiring a consistent completion to a quantum gravity theory. Sure. Uh, because it's a, it's a, it's kind of a loaded subject. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and I'm not claiming to have sort of any, you know, definitive tests for you. What I'm trying to argue is that understanding universal features is sort of a, a crucial step in ultimately, if we're ultimately going to, to bring string theory into contact with observation. We need to know what string theory predicts before we can actually test those predictions. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks. So uh, good. So uh, let me move on. So uh, so here are just a few of the uh, conjectures which have been discussed. There is unfortunately a bit of a trade-off in these conjectures between uh, rigor on the one hand and uh, sort of the interestingness of the implications on the other. So conjectures that tend to be more rigorously established, like for instance, I would say no global symmetry is this sort of up here, t tends to have more evidence in its favor, tends to have better arguments, tends to be more rigorously established. These conjectures tend to have less interesting implications for phenomenology and cosmology. On the other hand, conjectures like the De Sitter conjectures uh, would have extremely interesting consequences if true, but on the other hand, they tend to have evident, to not have as much evidence in their favor. Uh, and in many cases, they probably just aren't true at all. 
So where we'd really like to be, of course, is up here, where we have conjectures that are both rigorously established and also have interesting implications. And so we're trying to move into this region either by coming up, uh, giving more evidence for some of the conjectures down here or by deriving new interesting consequences from the conjectures over here. Now, I think probably the closest that we've gotten to this upper right-hand corner is through the weak gravity conjecture and the family of weak gravity conjectures related to it. So that's what I'm primarily going to focus on today, but certainly many, many interesting things could be said about all of these different swamp lane conjectures. Okay, so uh, with that, let me start out with the statements uh, of no global symmetries. This is one of the more, I would say, more rigorously established conjectures, one without too many interesting implications, however. So the statement of no global symmetries is, is basically just what it sounds like. The statement is that there should be no exact global symmetries in a consistent quantum gravity theory. Uh, I'm going to walk through sort of the old standard argument, which specifically applies to the case of continuous global symmetries. But uh, it's generally believed, and there have been also some arguments in the last few years, that this should apply to discrete global symmetries as well. But what, what's, the, uh, what's the argument? So there's this argument from uh, Banks and Cyberg in 2010 or in, in their paper, which I think is actually, uh, uh, actually ought to be attributed to the work of Hawking in the 80s. Uh, but they, they consider the following thought experiment, okay? So let's suppose that we have some global symmetry, global symmetry uh, uh, whose group is G, which is some continuous group. So G could be, say, like U1 or SUN or something like that. And we're going to suppose we have some particle here of, of mass m, which transforms in some representation r of the global symmetry group. So if g is u1, this is just some charge. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some huge collection of these particles of mass m, representation r, and I'm going to allow them to form a black hole of mass big M, whose charge is going to be given simply by the tensor product of the representation R of all of these guys. And if I start with N of these particles, there's going to be N of these guys here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this black hole Hawking evaporate. I'm going to let it Hawking evaporate until it uh, reaches a size of order M Planck when the Hawking process stops being reliable. And the point is that there, there's, no, there's nothing that prevents me from having some decay channel in which particles and antiparticles of this uh, particle here of mass M representation R are emitted in equal numbers. So in other words, there's nothing that's going to prevent me from having a Planck-sized black hole uh, left over that still carries this very large representation of the global symmetry group. And now here's, here we have an issue. Because I can do this, I can repeat this procedure for many, many different values of n. I can let n be as large as I like, which means I'm going to get some very large, in fact, infinite family of black hole microstates indexed by n, by this integer n, for a single macro state, which just has this mass of order m Planck. Because this is a global symmetry charge, there's no way for an outside observer to tell that it's carrying this huge representation. If it were a gauge symmetry charge, an outside observer would feel an electric field, and they could tell what the charge is. But here, it's a global symmetry. There's no way to tell the charge. Therefore, to an outside observer, all of these states look the same. 
I get an infinite family of black hole microstates indexed by n for a single macro state. This is what's known as a black hole remnant. It will just be a stable black hole. It's kinematically stable because there's no combination of these particles that this black hole could emit to get rid of all of its charge. So it's going to sit there. I'm going to have this Planck sized black hole that just sits there. And uh, I have this huge number of microstates, this huge degeneracy. It will violate uh, the covariant entropy bound. If I let these things run in loops, they'll lead to renorm infinite renormalization effects. Basically, bad things happen when we have these remnants. And so the conclusion is if we don't want these remnants, then that means that there can just not be any global symmetry. It's important that this was a continuous symmetry in this argument, because if it's a discrete symmetry, there's only a finite number of representations. So I can't let n be as large as I'd like. So this is sort of the standard argument against exact continuous global symmetries in quantum gravity. And uh, notice that there's no reference to string theory. This is more of a bottom-up type argument. OK, so, so that's sort of the, the first example of a swampland conjecture. Uh, now let's talk about the next one, which will really be the star of our show, which is the weak gravity conjecture. The weak gravity conjecture holds the following. Suppose I have some d-dimensional quantum gravity theory with some u1 gauge field. So in particular, our universe has electromagnetism and d is equal to 4. The claim of the weak gravity conjecture is that there exists some particle of charge q, which is equal to the gauge coupling E times the quantized charge n. So for an electron, this would be like the electric coupling constant, and n would be equal to 1. Mass m which is super extremal. In the sense that if I look at the ratio of the charge divided by the mass, this is greater than or equal to the charge to mass ratio of some large extremal black hole. In Planck units, this is going to be equal to some order one number. So I'm going to call gamma sub d divided by the uh, reduced Planck mass in d dimensions to the appropriate power, which is d minus 2 over 2. So this is some order one factor. So uh, pictorially, what does this look like? If I plot charge here on the x-axis and mass on the y-axis, the black hole extremality bound is a linear relationship between charge and mass. So extremal black holes live on this line. Subextremal black holes live up in this region. And the statement of the weak gravity conjecture is that we need something which is super extremal. So in other words, this particle, if I plot it in this uh, plane, it must lie on or below this dashed line, which is the black hole extremality bound. The statement of the weak gravity conjecture isn't that every particle needs to satisfy this bound. It's just that there is ex at least one particle which does. OK, so this is, I think, pretty simple, but it's still helpful to consider a particular example. So let's look at an example, which is just electromagnetism in our own universe. Simple example, something we're familiar with. Uh, so electromagnetism in our universe has this particle, which you've heard of, called the electron, which has a 
charge, which is about uh, 0 0.1, that's roughly the electric coupling constant, and it has a mass, which is something like 10 to the minus 21 in Planck units. So if I consider this ratio, Q over M, that's roughly equal to 10 to the 20 times 1 over M Planck, the four-dimensional Planck scale, which is much, much larger than 1 over M Planck. And so the electron satisfies the weak gravity conjecture with plenty of room to spare by many orders of magnitude. So uh, this isn't so surprising, really. Uh, so, so the conjecture, uh, the weak gravity conjecture is not so surprising, right? I mean, it's, it's satisfied by many orders of magnitude in our own universe. But the claim of the weak gravity conjecture is that this should actually be true more generally for any U1 gauge theory in any consistent theory of gravity, of quantum gravity. Uh, it's worth maybe making a remark at this point. Um, suppose that we were to consider a setup where we have two electrons separated by a very long distance. Well, you, you remember from your uh, high school classes, right, that we can sort of draw this thing called a free body diagram, uh, labeling the forces on one of these electrons. And there's going to be an electromagnetic repulsion between the two of them. And there's also going to be a gravitational attraction. And you might ask which of them is, uh, is larger. And the answer here, of course, is that the electromagnetic repulsion is much, much larger than the gravitational attraction. It turns out that this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the statement that the electron is super extremal. or that it satisfies the WGC. So the statement that the electron is self-repulsive in the sense that a pair of electrons will repel each other is equivalent to the statement that the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied by the electron. Another way uh, to say the weak gravity conjecture, therefore, is, is, is that it's the conjecture that gravity should, in a sense, be the weakest force. And indeed, the original uh, paper on the weak gravity conjecture from uh, Arkani Hamed, uh, Modal, Nicolis, and Vafa from 2006 was called something like the string landscape, black holes, and gravity as the weakest force. So really, this is a statement about the strength of the gravitational force relative to the other forces. It's maybe, uh, although we probably won't discuss it too much in this talk, it's worth noting that this relationship between self-repulsiveness and super extremality is true only if, uh, only because there are no massless scalars in the standard model. If I, if I have a massless scalar in my theory, it mediates a long range attractive force, the same way that gravity mediates a long range attractive force. And in such a theory, the relationship between being super extremal and being self-repulsive is no longer one-to-one. -one. There can be particles which are self-repulsive, yet not super-extremal. There can be particles which are super-extremal and yet not self-repulsive. But it, in the standard model, where there's no massless scalar fields, we don't have to worry about that. And these two statements are exactly the same. OK, so let me move on now to. Uh, the motivation. So why should this weak gravity conjecture be true, not just for electromagnetism, but more generally in a consistent theory of quantum gravity? I'm going to explain the original argument that was given in this original paper as to uh, why the conjecture should be true. But I'm going to then explain why it's really not a very compelling motivation. So it's, it's far from a rigorous proof. There's a reason why this is called the weak gravity conjecture and not the weak gravity theorem. So the thought experiment that, they, that the original authors considered is, they said, let's suppose that we have a black hole, which is, is extremal. 
So in appropriate units, the charge of this black hole is equal to its mass. Well, what, what I can do then, if I have a particle which satisfies the weak gravity bound, Q greater than M, is that this black hole can give off one of these particles. And what I'll be left with is a slightly smaller black hole whose charge is now smaller than its mass. So it's sub-extremal. And this guy can give off another one of these particles. And if I wait long enough, you know, this thing could actually just evaporate down into nothing by emitting some combination of these particles. So this is the case where the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. Now, what if the weak gravity conjecture is not satisfied? Well, then I start out with this black hole, Q equals M, and any particle which this guy is going to emit necessarily has Q less than M because the theory doesn't satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. In that case, this resulting black hole is going to actually be super extremal. It's going to have a charge which is larger than its mass. And it turns out that this sort of a decay process just doesn't happen. One way to see that, that why it might be problematic is that this sort of super extremal black hole here would violate cosmic censorship. It has a naked singularity. And so this, you know, this doesn't happen. This is not something, uh, this is not something that uh, we want to allow. And so instead what will happen is this black hole will just be stable. It will just sit there. We'll have this stable black hole with uh, Q equal to M and it'll just sit there and sequester its information indefinitely. Now we, we already came across an example of stable black holes once in this talk when we were looking at the case of no global symmetries. And there we said that there was this problem because we get these things called remnants. Stable black hole, Planck incised, huge degeneracy. In this case, we have stable black holes, but these stable black holes are not remnants. There isn't any sort of infinite degeneracy. Instead, we have only a finite number of these stable black holes below any given mass scale. Because as the uh, charge of this black hole increases, so does its mass, which is different from the case of the global symmetry that we saw before. And so this doesn't lead to any infinite renormalization effects. It doesn't violate any known entropy bounds. There isn't anything obviously wrong with having stable extremal black holes in your theory. So as I say, this motivation really isn't all that compelling. Nonetheless, for whatever reason, it seems to have gotten people to start digging in the right place. Because by now, there are many, many examples and other arguments that have been given in favor of the weak gravity conjecture, which we'll get to next time. But for today, we're just going to sort of keep this motivation in the back of our head. Remember that the weak gravity conjecture is, is motivated by the idea or the desire to forbid stable black holes. And we're going to just work with that. Okay, so uh, with this now, let's talk a little bit about some generalizations of the weak gravity conjecture. And the first one that's I think worth mentioning is the weak gravity conjecture for multiple gauge fields. So for multiple U1s. What I've been talking about so far is just a theory like our own standard model, which just has a single U1 gauge group. But we can more generally consider a theory that has many U1s. So what, what, to, what should the weak gravity conjecture be saying in this case? And it turns out that the weak gravity conjecture in this case is equivalent to something that's known as the convex hull condition. Or just the CHC. And this is pointed out in a paper from 2014 by uh, Cliff Chung and Grant Remen, who actually uh, just finished a postdoc at Berkeley. So, so how does this convex hull condition work? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take my particles in the theory. So I have some particle, or more accurately, some particle species, I. So like this could be, say, the electron or a neutrino or something like that. I runs over all the particle species in the theory. 
And for each such particle species, I'm going to define what's known as the charge to mass vector, z sub i, which is equal to the charge vector of the ith particle divided by its mass, normalized by the Planck scale. Uh, we'll suppose that we're working in four dimensions. So this is just m Planck, four, and uh, divided by the uh, order one number gamma that we saw earlier. So again, we'll, we'll just work in four dimensions for, for simplicity. And so this is just gamma four. This charge vector here, uh, why do we have a charge vector? So if I have a U1, I have a charge. If I have two U1s, I have two charges. And if I have N U1s, then there's, I'm going to have an N vector of charges. So this labels the charge under each of the N different U1s. So now the claim, the statement of the weak gravity conjecture is equal to the statement that the convex hull of the zi for all the different particles in the theory should contain the unit ball in Rn, where n here is, again, the number of u1s. So let me draw an example. Let's say, say we have a theory that has two u1s. So we can look at the uh, charge q1 over m times m Planck over gamma 4. And here, q2 over m, m Planck over gamma 4. So I'm plotting the charge to mass for the first u1 on this axis, charge to mass for the second u1 on this axis. Here are all my particle species. They, they fit somewhere on this, uh, in this plane. And I can draw the convex hull by connecting all of these dots like so. So this is the convex hull of this set of points. The claim of the weak gravity conjecture is that this convex hull should contain the unit ball, the ball of radius 1. And you might wonder why, what, what's so special about the ball. And the point is that this is the region in this space where black holes live. Extremal black holes live on the boundary. Subextremal black holes live in the interior. And if any region, any subregion here, is not contained in the unit ball, so for instance, if I have a situation more like this, and the ball looks something like this, now we're actually going to get a violation of the convex hull condition. And as a consequence, any black holes that live in this region outside of the convex hull, these black holes cannot decay. There's no combination of this particle here and this particle here, with which this black hole can emit, which will allow it to evaporate completely. So the black holes in here will just be stable. Now, I think it's especially worth noting, uh, worth looking at this picture here, this example, uh, what I've drawn here, because you'll notice that the two particle species that I drew in, this guy here and its corresponding antiparticle, this guy here and its corresponding antiparticle, all of these are super extremal in the sense that the magnitude of their charge vector divided by the mass satisfies the weak gravity bound. But even though these guys are super extremal, the theory still violates the weak gravity conjecture because there's no super extremal particle with respect to this diagonal direction here. And so it's not enough just to have two super extremal particles in a theory with two U1s you need for sort of any, any U1 direction, any direction in this charge space, to have some super extremal, possi possibly multi-particle state. OK, so that's the convex hull condition. Uh, now, let me talk about sort of uh, another one more generalization, which is, I think we're on letter D here which is the case from uh, the generalization from one form gauge fields to p form gauge fields. 
So, so far we've been dealing with just the case of an ordinary one form gauge field. By one form, I mean the, the gauge field A mu has just one index. But more generally in quantum field theory and in quantum gravity, we can have higher form gauge fields, which would be something like this. Some gauge field, which has not just one, but P indices. So this is uh, what's known as a P-form gauge field. For the case of the ordinary weak gravity conjecture for a one-form gauge field, remember the statement is that the charge divided by the mass should be greater than or equal to some you know, gamma D over M Planck to the appropriate power, which is equal to the uh, charge to mass ratio of an extremal black hole. For the case of these higher p-form gauge fields, there's a similar statement, only instead of the charge now, we we're going to have the charge density Q, which is the charge per unit volume of some higher dimensional, or specifically some p-dimensional object. And instead of the mass, we're going to have the tension, which is the mass per unit volume of this p-dimensional object. This needs to be greater than, again, some order one factor, which now depends on both d, the dimensionality of space-time, and p, the dimensionality of this object, over m Planck in d dimensions, just some appropriate power, which is equal to the charge density to tension ratio of an extremal black object of dimension p. So for p equals 2, these charged objects are going to be strings. And so the statement is that the charge to tension ratio of one of these strings should be greater than or equal to the charge to tension ratio of an extremal black string. For p greater than or equal to 3, these are what are called P brains, or actually it would be a P minus one brains in the standard terminology. So the statement is that you need some, some brains of the appropriate dimension, which are charged under this P form gauge field and have a charge density to tension ratio, which is sufficiently large. So this immediately generalizes the weak gravity conjecture uh, from the case of a one-form gauge field to p greater than or equal to 2. Uh, and you can play a similar game with the case of multiple such gauge fields. You can define a convex hull condition for these guys as well. And the story works uh, perfectly analogously to what we just saw. What's especially interesting to, to think about is the case of p equals 0. And we'll see that when it comes to consequences of the weak gravity conjecture, the p equals zero case is especially interesting, even though it's not really quite as easy to define. So for the case of p equals zero, what we're dealing with now is a, p, is a zero form gauge field. Which is a scalar phi, which is periodic. So phi, so it has a, a gauge symmetry of phi goes to phi plus two pi. So this is what's known as an axion, or a zero form gauge field, or a scalar field with a shift symmetry, or a periodic scalar field, all, all meaning, these all mean the same thing for our perspective. So uh, in this case, the statement of the weak gravity conjecture should be some bound on objects of dimension zero, which are points in space which are also known as instantons. So whereas a particle is localized in space but travels through time, an instanton is localized in both space and time. And these instantons uh, are going to have something sort of analogous to charge, 
which is going to be uh, given by this quantity f inverse, where f is the axion decay constant associated with the field phi. And the tension, or the mass, is going to be something called the instanton action, S. So the statement of the weak gravity conjecture here is that F inverse over S should be greater than 1 over M Planck in four dimensions. Now, and importantly here, you'll note that there's a squiggle. So in the other cases, in the previous cases, let's remind ourselves about those. In these previous cases, we actually had sharp inequalities and we had sharp order one factors, gamma sub d and gamma sub d p. These, these are order one coefficients which are actually known. For instance, in 4d, for the, for the ordinary case of p equals one, gamma sub d is just the square root of two. And this is because in these cases, we have these extremal black holes. We can just work out explicitly up to this precise order one factor what the extremality bound is. In the case at hand of axions, there's no such thing as a black instanton. There's no sort of question about black instantons evaporating. And so the best we can do is just put this order one factor here and this squiggle. So this zero form version of the conjecture isn't as easy to define. It's not as sharply defined, but still this expression here, uh, which is equivalent, of course, to the statement that F S is less than M Planck, we'll see is going to actually be an important, an important inequality that has some interesting implications. Okay, so finally, I'm, uh, I have three minutes. But the last thing I wanna talk about are strong forms of the weak gravity conjecture. So we've, we've seen a few generalizations so far, but all of what we talked about is sometimes called just the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, we can actually make even stronger statements or impose even stronger conditions, uh, which seem to be satisfied in the quantum gravity theories or specifically the string theory examples that we know of. So uh, there have been a number of strong forms, a number of strengthenings of the weak gravity conjecture, which have been proposed uh, you know, over the last 15 years. But many of them have actually been discarded as counterexamples have been found. However, there's a growing body of evidence that points to a particular class of strong forms of the weak gravity conjecture being true. And these are what are known as tower or sublattice versions of the weak gravity conjecture. And it's easiest to explain what these are uh, pictorially. You remember we drew this diagram of the weak gravity conjecture before. We said that there needs to exist at least one particle which is on or below this line. The idea behind the tower and sublattice weak gravity conjecture is that instead, you can't just have a single particle down here, but you need a whole infinite tower of such particles, which generally uh, asymptote to this extremality bound as you go to increasing mass and increasing charge. So this is a tower of WGC satisfying particles. To be more precise, and you can convince yourself that this definition will give you this sort of tower, the statement of the tower weak gravity conjecture is the statement that uh, given some charge vector in, your, in the charge lattice of your theory, this is the charge lattice, There exists n such that there exists a super extremal particle of charge n times q, where here n, n is an integer. 
this is going to give me an infinite tower because if I just take Q to be larger and larger, then I'm going to, to ultimately get sort of a whole infinite tower. The sublattice weak gravity conjecture is the same thing, only N cannot depend on Q. In other words, there's a universal N such that given any Q, any vector Q in the charge lattice, there's going to exist uh, a super extremal particle of charge N times Q. And you can convince yourself that the consequence of this is that the set of super extremal particles will fill out some full dimensional sublattice of the charge lattice. So if the charge lattice you know, is some, uh, some lattice like this in Rn, then the sublattice weak gravity conjecture will, will give you uh, particles which satisfy the weak gravity bound, say at all of these sites here on some, uh, some sublattice, and so on and so forth. OK, so uh, we're out of time for today. As I said, this is definitely the most boring day. All we did was learn some definitions, see a little bit of the, what motivated historically the weak gravity conjecture and the statement of no global symmetries. But already, you can sort of, I mean, you're probably already thinking to yourself, you know, these, these sound like really simple conjectures, right? These sound like very basic statements, just that there exists in any gauge theory some particles whose charge isn't too small relative to its mass. So that, that's really the, that's the entirety of the statement of the conjecture. And yet we're going to see that this simple statement has con consequences for everything from black hole physics, cosmic censorship, cosmology, even things like pure math and geometry. Many, many, many different areas of high energy physics and mathematics can be connected to this very, very simple set of statements. So that's what we're going to look at in the, uh, in the next couple of sessions. Uh, let me pause here and see and just if there are any questions from today. Should we raise our hand on, on the chat or can we just ask? Um, I think you can just go ahead and ask if you like. Okay. Um, so I had, I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is sort of why is it, or could, could one find a, a getting around of the, 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 the fact that the argument for the, what was it called? It was called the, the no global symmetries conjecture. Um, they didn't work for discrete symmetries. So I, I don't understand why is it that multiplicity doesn't count, uh, um, you know, in finite groups we would get it eventually like the same, the same, the, the, the same representations by high multiplicity and why that doesn't count as a new microstate, or if one could get around by introducing some other quantum number that distinguishes the microstates. Well, there, there might be some other quantum number that distinguishes them, but presumably what that would correspond to is some other like continuous global symmetry. So if you just have a discrete global symmetry, then there's only a finite number, of, uh, there's only you know, a finite choice, uh, finite set of, of quantum numbers for you to choose from, uh, or only a finite, set that, that this quantum number can take. And so you're not going to get like this infinite degeneracy. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's really the instant, that's really the, the, the issue here is that just the, there's only a few, there can only be a finite number of these, of these uh, different states. Now, presumably, if you were to consider say a ZN group where N is taken to be very, very large, at some point you run into problems for the same reason, because at some point, you know, if, if you're considering Z of a billion, then that's a, a billion different possible remnant states. So uh, I think some people have actually looked into trying to make this a little bit more quantitative and, and saying sort of how large N can be, but, um, but definitely that, that's, it requires a little bit, uh, a little bit more work and a little, and a little bit uh, more quantitative understanding. Here we just ran into this infinite degeneracy, and so that's that's really a signal that something's going wrong. Okay, thank you. And, and the other question was more, more of a curiosity of, of of what sort of problems does one try to run uh, one run into if one tries to do this weak gravity conjecture for 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 other charges that are not U one. Okay, good. Yeah. So so there. 
one can per perfectly well um, write down an, an, an analogous statement of the weak gravity conjecture for more general gauge fields. Um, in fact, oh, huh, I've created the maximum number of whiteboards, it's telling me. Okay, so the, uh, so the statement of the weak gravity conjecture for non-abelian gauge fields would be defined similarly. It's a statement about the ratio of the, the charge under some carton generator uh, rel uh, relative to the mass. So in that case, uh, so for instance, for like SU2, right, you have the doublet representation, which has charge one half or spin one half, if you will. And so that's telling you that one half times the gauge coupling uh, divided by the mass has to be greater than or equal to that for an extremal black hole. So you can define it the same way. You can define a, a tower and sublattice version analogously where you, you demand that you have not just particles of increasing charge, but now you have particles of increasingly large representations, uh, which, which satisfy the weak gravity bound. So the whole story can be run ana analogously. It's just a little bit simpler to talk about U1s. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much, I enjoyed it a lot, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, if not, I guess what I encourage you all to do is uh, before Wednesday's talk, just sort of review uh, the different versions of the conjecture that we talked about. We talked, remember we talked about the Tower sublattice version, the p-form version, the convex hull condition. Remind yourself of the definitions, uh, and then we'll uh, next time, as I say, we'll we'll really get into some more interesting things and look at some of the different evidences uh, and arguments that have been given in favor of the conjecture. So great! Uh, uh, stop recording here, and I guess I'll see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>